Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the basement membrane. Okay, so now what we've seen so far is that the basement membrane consists of two layers, the lamina lucida and then below it, the lamina densa. Okay, we're currently studying the lamina lucida, and we've seen that one of the major components of the lamina lucida, in fact, the major component of the lamina lucida, is these heterotrimeric laminin complexes, which consist of an alpha laminin, a beta laminin, and a gamma laminin. Okay, and that these will polymerize together to form this sheet, okay, which basically is tessellating hexagons, okay, and then pointing up from this sheet, you have the tails of the uh, laminins, which form this coiled coil domain, and then right at the end of it, you have uh, the C-terminal domain of the alpha laminin, which has these uh, five laminin G-like domains, also they're just known as LG domains. Okay, right. Now, these five LG domains are going to interact with receptors on the surface of the epithelial cells, and these receptors are going to be a type of integrin, okay? So integrins are a massive great family of receptors which generally bind to components of the extracellular matrix. These laminins are a specific example of a component of the extracellular matrix which certain integrins are capable of binding to. Okay, so the integrins consist of a, a dimer of an alpha subunit with a beta integrin subunit, okay? And the extracellular side is what's going to bind to the uh, extracellular matrix component, and the intracellular side is then going to bind to the cytoskeleton of the cell. Okay, so let's just have a little discussion of the cytoskeleton of a cell. Okay, so this requires some maturity in your understanding of molecular biology. Okay, so, you know, when we draw cells, we often draw something that looks like this, and I'll give it a nucleus here. So, we draw the cytoplasm as this sort of empty, fluid-filled space. In reality, this uh, cytoplasm is full of a very rigid protein meshwork. Okay, because if we think about this picture that we've drawn here, we'll realize that there is something wrong with it. Okay, the membrane is a gooey gloop, basically. Okay, so what makes cells maintain their same structure? Well, if the cytoplasm was just gloop as well, then the cell would just sort of be, you know, it would be a blob that could be squashed and moved into all sorts of different conformations. It would continuously be changing its shape. Okay, the cells do not continuously change their shape, not at least at that sort of rapidity, okay? And the region is, the reason is rather, that they have um, a rigid meshwork of protein fibers uh, within them, basically. Okay, and if we were to draw this, it would look something like this. So all over the place you have a meshwork of protein fibers which are rigid, basically, and which are holding the uh, cell membrane up, basically, and holding the entire cell in the shape that it is. Okay, and this meshwork of proteins, this is what's known as the cytoskeleton. So cyto means cell. Skeleton means the structure which is holding the cell up, basically. Okay, right. Now, one of the major components of the cytoskeleton is something known as actin filaments. Okay, so let me just now explain to you what an actin filament is. Okay, so these are one of these major fibers that is involved in holding the cell in a certain shape. Okay, so... Basically, in order to discuss what an actin filament is, we first need to discuss what an actin monomer is. Okay, so actin is a small globular protein, which we will represent as a ball like this. This is an actin monomer. However, what can happen is actin can polymerize, okay, together and form actin filaments, okay? And basically, what an actin filament is, is it's an intertwined, well, it's two actin uh, polymers intertwined together, okay? So what an actin filament looks like is as follows. You have the two strands intertwining among one another like so. Okay, 
forming a double helix, effectively. Okay, now what is each one of these strands? Well, it's loads and loads of actin monomers joined together, basically. Okay, so that strand that I've highlighted in red, what that basically is, is loads and loads of these actin monomers all polymerized together. Okay, and when you take two of these actin polymers, like so, and intertwine them around one another to form a double helix, that then is called an actin filament. So this double helix of two actin polymers intertwined amongst one another, this is known as an actin filament, okay, down here. Right, uh, so these are one of the major components of the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is a meshwork, and one of the key components of this meshwork is these actin filaments. Okay, right, now, integrins well, nearly all of the 24 known integrins bind to uh, the actin filaments within the cytoskeleton of cells, okay? So, how do they do this? Well, basically, what happens is the beta integrin is going to bind to a protein, okay? And this is a massive, great protein that has a number of repeating domains, okay? So, this is supposed to represent the fact that it's got many of these repeating domains, and these domains uh, combine to actin proteins within an actin filament, okay? So, what's this protein known as? Well, this protein is called the talin protein, or the talin protein. Okay, right, and just to highlight this, what can happen is that an actin monomer within the actin filament can bind to one of these domains that is repeated multiple times within the tailin protein. So this is supposed to represent our actin filament here, although in reality they'd be intertwined amongst one another. Okay, but it's difficult to show that when you're actually drawing the balls. Okay, right. Uh, so in addition, uh, you can attach actin filaments to tailin indirectly as well by means of another protein. So another protein can also bind to these repeating domains within the tailin protein. Okay, and we'll show this uh, other protein in turquoise here. Okay, and this protein is known as vincolin. Okay, so vincolin can bind to the same repeating domain within the tailin protein that binds to actin monomers and then vincolin combined to an actin monomer. And I'll put in more effort this time to show the two actin polymers intertwining in this actin filament. Okay, so here is the actin filament with the actin monomers intertwining amongst one another to make a double helix like so. Whoops. Okay, so uh, this then is how um, these integrin um, heterodimers bind to the components of the um, cytoskeleton, specifically the actin filaments of the cytoskeleton. Okay, right. Uh, so, now what we want to discuss is which integrins are then capable of binding to the five laminin G-like domains of a, a laminin heterotrimer. Uh, that's in the extracellular fluid. Okay, one example, a key example of an integrin that is capable of binding to laminins is alpha 6 beta 1. So that means that the alpha integrin is the alpha 6 integrin and the beta integrin is beta 1. Okay, so going back to this picture here, this cell here that is uh, one of our epithelial cells, this will have integrins on its epithelial, um, sorry, on its um, basolateral surface here, okay? And let's, for instance, say that this is one of these integrins that is capable of binding to these five LG domains uh, on the laminin heterotrimer here, okay? So let's say it's an alpha-6 beta-1 integrin here, okay? So let's just highlight the different portions in. So here in blue is alpha-6, here in turquoise is beta-1. And this integrin is then going to bind to that LG domain here, or those five LG domains here. Okay, and that then is how we have attached our cell to the lamina lucida through these integrin connections 
to uh, the LG domains of the laminin heterotrimers. Okay, because remember, the integrin will also now be attaching via tailin. So I'll draw tailin here. So tailin was shown in orange previously, so I'll stick to that. So here's tailin, and it will be attaching via tailin either directly or indirectly through vincolin uh, to the actin filaments within the cytoskeleton of the cell. So that's the rigid structure of the cell. So you're effectively attaching onto the skeleton of the cell and therefore you're attached onto the cell nice and rigidly there. Because if you're attached to the cytoskeleton, the rest of the cell isn't going anywhere basically. Okay, right. So that's how we attach cells onto this first layer of the basement membrane, the lamina lucida. Okay, now what we're going to do is move our attention to the second layer of the basement membrane, okay, which is the lamina densa. Okay, right. Now, the lamina lucida consisted of these laminin proteins. The lamina densa is going to consist of uh, type 4 collagen, okay? So this is mainly going to consist of type for collagen. So I would just like to have a brief discussion of the structure of collagen with you. Okay, right. So, we'll start off with the structure of an individual collagen polypeptide. Okay, we'll then talk about the uh, superhelix, a collagen superhelix, and then we'll talk about the formation of collagen fibrils and even collagen fibers. Okay, right. So, Basically, at present, I believe there are 45 known genes for collagen proteins within humans, okay? So, 49 genes for collagen. Okay, right. So, it is fundamentally a protein. It's a very big protein, okay? So, here's its amino terminus here, and here's its carboxylic acid terminus. And basically, it folds up into a massive alpha helix. Okay, so let's just discuss alpha helices in more detail than we have discussed them previously, because they're going to be so important to understanding the structure of collagen. Okay, so basically, an alpha helix is a spring-like structure. The polypeptide folds into this spring-like structure here. Okay, now there are actually two different types of alpha helices. Okay, uh, there is this one here, and the one that we've got here is known as a left-handed alpha helix. Okay, but there is also a different type of alpha helix. Um, there is the right-handed alpha helix as well. Okay, now let me firstly tell you what characteristic feature the left-handed alpha helix had. Basically, if you imagine ascending up the alpha helix, you are going round in a clockwise direction, okay? So I'll talk you through this. We're going backwards at the moment. Now we're coming forwards. We're looping back round, back round, right to the back. We're coming forwards again, okay? And can you see that the way we're going round, we are going round in a clockwise direction, okay? So as we ascend upwards, we loop round and round and round in a clockwise direction. If instead, you were looping up in an anti-clockwise direction, okay, let me show this now here, okay? So we're going forwards, we're going backwards, okay? We're coming forwards, we're going backwards, okay? We're coming forwards, we're going backwards like so. This now is called a right-handed alpha helix. Okay, so when, as you ascend upwards, you loop round anti-clockwise, basically, that then is called um, a right-handed alpha helix. Okay, and you might say, well, surely if I just spin this one up the other way around, it'll now be a left-handed alpha helix. Try and think that through in your head. It won't be, basically. This sort of an alpha helix is fundamentally different from this form. You can't just spin this one round and expect it suddenly to become a left-handed alpha helix, okay? If you do think it through in your head, have a good visualize, you'll see that even if I spin this up the other way round, I can't turn it into a left-handed alpha helix. These two are fundamentally different. Either you ascend going round in this anti-clockwise direction, in which case you are a right-handed alpha helix, or when you ascend, you go round in the clockwise direction, in which case you are the left-handed alpha helix. 
Okay, right. So that's the two different types of alpha helice. Collagen is going to be a left-handed alpha helix. That's the first thing to say. It's going to be a massive, great left-handed alpha helix. Okay, right. Now, what I also would like to discuss is how uh, proteins actually end up folding into these alpha helice structures. Okay, so they are secondary protein structures, which means that they're not going to be held together by bonds between R groups of the amino acids. Instead, they're going to be held together by bonds that form between uh, the groups of the peptide links, the core groups. Okay, so let's draw this here. So, um, let me put an example of an amino acid here. In fact, I'll keep it general. I won't put a specific example, but I'll put an amino acid here. Okay, so let me put an amino acid here. So this line represents a polymer of amino acids. Now I'm suddenly going to draw an amino acid here. So here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. And here's the R group. Okay, then here is the carboxylic acid group here. Then the polypeptide will loop around like so. Okay, and then it will come down to the next level. I'm going to draw the next amino acid here. Okay, so here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it, here's the R group, and here is the carboxylic acid group. Okay, and then the polypeptide will continue on. Okay, and generally, in one turn, like this, there should actually be around three amino acids, especially in collagen, it's going to be around three amino acids. Okay, clearly my picture has exaggerated it a little bit. There's, it doesn't look as though there is... Uh, going to be three amino acids in one turn, okay, because there's one there, there's a round one there, and that's one turn, so the, all of this is meant to represent one final amino acid, no, uh, but uh, in collagen there is going to be around three amino acids making up one turn. Okay, right, but this picture is just to demonstrate how it's all held together. Okay, so it's going to be held together by hydrogen bonds, okay, so uh, in order to understand hydrogen bonds, we need to firstly understand the concept of electronegativity. Okay, so electronegativity is a really important concept in the formation of hydrogen bonds. Okay, so if we just draw a bond between a nitrogen atom and a hydrogen atom, such as what we have here, okay, we know that this single covalent bond will contain two electrons. Okay, it will contain one electron which has come from the nitrogen atom, which we'll say is this one here in red, okay? And it will then contain one electron that has come from the hydrogen atom, which we'll say is this one here in blue. Okay, right. Now, the question is, these two electrons that are in this single covalent bond here, are they sitting right in the middle between the nitrogen and the hydrogen atom, or are they tilted to one side, basically? Okay, well to answer this question we need to be thinking about what forces these electrons are actually going to feel. Well, they're going to feel attraction to the nuclei of both the nitrogen atom and also the hydrogen atom. Okay, because the nuclei of both the nitrogen and the hydrogen atom will have protons within them. They'll also have neutrons, but they're neutral, so we can ignore those. But they have protons within them. Okay, protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge, so the electrons are going to feel an attraction towards the positively charged protons at the nuclei of the nitrogen and the hydrogen atom. Okay, the question then is which of these attractions is stronger? We might say, well, surely it's going to be the nitrogen atom, because the nitrogen atom has more protons in its nucleus than hydrogen. Hydrogen is pathetic, it just has one proton. Nitrogen will have a few more than that, so surely we're going to get a greater attraction to the nitrogen. But it's not that simple, because you also have to think about the fact that the nitrogen will have other electrons closer to the nucleus than these electrons here, which will be shielding the positive charge of the nucleus from these electrons. Whereas the hydrogen, it doesn't have any more electrons. This is its only electron here. So there's nothing shielding these electrons from the positive charge of the hydrogen nucleus. So it's very complicated to actually work out which one is going to pull harder. Okay. However, we have a nice big word just to summarize that concept. 
OK? And the concept is called electronegativity. So electronegativity just means how hard an atom will pull on electrons that are within a covalent bond like this, OK? So it turns out that nitrogen is actually going to end up pulling on these electrons harder than hydrogen, OK? So we would say that nitrogen has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen, meaning that it pulls on the electrons in this covalent bond harder than hydrogen pulls on those electrons. OK, so that means that these electrons in this single covalent bond here are going to sit tilted towards the nitrogen atom. Now that's going to give the nitrogen atom a partial negative charge, and it's going to give the hydrogen a partial positive charge. OK, so let's put this on this diagram here. So here we have this nitrogen here, which will have a partial negative charge. OK, and here we have a hydrogen, which will have a partial positive charge down there. Now, a hydrogen with a partial positive charge is one of the things that you need in order to form a covalent bond. Sorry, in, for, in order to form a hydrogen bond, okay? And a hydrogen with a um, partial positive charge like that is known as a hydrogen bond donor, okay? So we've got our hydrogen bond donor, which is one of the components of a hydrogen bond here. OK, right. The other thing we need is a hydrogen bond acceptor, and that's going to be this oxygen here. So let's discuss the properties of a hydrogen bond acceptor. So firstly, we have an oxygen double bound to a carbon atom. We can ask the same question as for the electrons in this bond between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. Do they sit in the middle, or do they sit tilted towards one of these atoms? Well, it turns out that oxygen's electronegativity is greater than carbon's electronegativity. So actually, the electrons do sit tilted towards the oxygen atom and away from the carbon atom, giving the oxygen a partial negative charge here, OK, and the carbon a partial positive charge. OK, so a partial negative charge is one of the properties that you need in order to be a hydrogen bond acceptor. But there is another property that you need in addition to just having a partial negative charge. You also need to have at least one lone pair of electrons. Now, oxygen actually has two lone pairs of electrons, but you don't need two. You only need one, so I'm only going to show one, even though there is a second lone pair on that oxygen as well. So this lone pair of electrons is the other thing that you need in order to be a hydrogen bond acceptor. So you need both a partial negative charge and a lone pair of electrons. What can now happen is this hydrogen atom, which is partially positively charged, and which is going to be the hydrogen bond donor, can form an electrostatic interaction with that lone pair of electrons on that partially negatively charged oxygen. And this very strong interaction between that um, partially positively charged hydrogen and that lone pair of electrons on the partially negatively charged oxygen, that is called a hydrogen bond. OK, now these are the, a very strong form of intermolecular bonding, OK? So this is what holds uh, these polypeptides in this alpha helical structure, basically. OK, right, so that's the bonds that hold an alpha helix together. Let, we've talked about the fact that it's going to be a left-hand alpha helix, which, of course, we have here. This is going nicely clockwise. OK, right, now let's talk about the amino acids in uh, the uh, collagen um, alpha helix. OK, and before we do that, actually, I'd just like to discuss the fact that there is three amino acids in each turn of collagen. OK, so I'm going to actually draw a little picture to show this. So we're now going to represent amino acids by blobs. OK, so here's an amino acid, here is an amino acid, and then coming out the front, we'll have another amino acid. And then you can go round, and this picture doesn't look as though it's going to end well here, but never mind, OK, like so. So this is the alpha helix. So here is our first amino acid here in red. OK. Then we have another amino acid there in blue. OK, that's going backwards. OK, so remember, we're going backwards like this and trying to form this alpha helix. What I should have done is drawn an alpha helix like this and then put the amino acids on here. In fact, I might do that instead. So we're going to have one amino acid here, 
one amino acid here, one amino acid here, and then we'll go into the next term, basically. So this is just trying to get across the point that it is three amino acids in each term, okay? So alpha alpha is just short for amino acid. Okay, right, so it kind of looks like this. This is what it looks like more in real life. Okay, so here's another amino acid in purple here. And we have the red one here, okay, then the blue one here, and then the purple one here. Okay, and then you'll have another turn of it again. Okay, right. Now, the next important thing for me to tell you is that every third amino acid in a collagen alpha helix is going to be a glycine residue, okay? Right, so let me show you the structure of a glycine residue. So I'm going to draw this as a residue, so I'm going to draw it so that it's bound within uh, a polypeptide. Okay, so here's the amino terminus. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen bound to it. Here's the carboxylic acid terminus bound to the amino group of the next amino acid along. Now the R group of a glycine residue is just a hydrogen. Okay, so this is glycine. Okay, so every third amino acid is going to be glycine. Okay, and we also know that every, uh, well, that the uh, each term is three amino acids long. So we'll say this is going to be a glycine one, this one's going to be a glycine one, and this one's going to be a glycine one, and this one will be a glycine one. Okay, so every third amino acid is a glycine residue. Now, the amino acids then that are in between the consecutive glycine residues, one of which we'll show in blue here, and then the other we'll have in vivid purple here. Okay, so let's just continue this. They are not set, okay? They are known respectively as the X, okay? So the X amino acid here and the Y amino acid here. So this one in blue, once again, will be the X amino acid and this one will be the Y amino acid here. Okay, so basically, in the polypeptide, you have the sequence glycine followed by X followed by Y, where X and Y here denote any amino acid, okay, variable amino acids. Y usually stands for tyrosine in single letter amino acid code, but in here we're not using it for that. Okay, X never has an amino acid uh, that it's meant to denote. It always represents an arbitrary amino acid. Okay, right. However, there are certain amino acids that are usually in both of these positions. So in the X position, you usually have the amino acid proline. So let me show you the structure of the amino acid proline. Okay, right. So we'll have the amino group here with an alpha carbon attached to it. Okay. The, oh, whoops. No, no, no. Um, get rid of all of that. We'll start this structure again, okay? So we're drawing proline. Proline is a, a different amino acid to the other ones. Okay, so here's the amino group with the alpha carbon attached to it, the hydrogen coming off the alpha carbon here, the carboxylic acid group here, and then the R group of proline consists of this five-membered ring structure that we're going to create here. Okay, so it consists of these three methylene groups, carbons with two hydrogens coming off, that are attached together to make this ring structure. So this is the structure of a proline amino acid. So usually, in that X position, you have proline amino acids. Okay, so I'll just highlight up glycine. Glycine's this one. Okay, proline is here. This one is usually this structure. Not always, but usually. Okay, now finally, what amino acid do you usually have in position Y? Well, this is usually a very special amino acid, okay? This is usually hydroxyproline. Now, hydroxyproline is not a normal amino acid. This is one that you find very, very rarely in proteins, and collagen is the main example of where you find hydroxyprolines. Okay, right. So what you do is you take one of the hydrogens off this carbon here within the proline R group and you replace it with an alcohol group to create hydroxyproline. So let's draw this here. So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off, here's the carboxylic acid group, and then the R group consists of a methylene group here, a methylene group here, but now over here we have a carbon atom with one hydrogen atom coming off and then also one alcohol group coming off like so. 
Okay, and that then is the structure of hydroxyproline, uh, which is normally the one in position Y. Okay, so collagen usually consists of these massive great alpha helices, where you have these free amino acids each turn going up on a left-handed style alpha helix, okay? And usually it's just glycine followed by proline, followed by hydroxyproline, glycine followed by proline, followed by hydroxyproline. Occasionally you'll have uh, little blips in that structure where you replace the proteins and the hydroxyproteins with something else. Okay, right. So we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll talk about is how you assemble these collagen proteins. And remember, we have 45 different genes coding for 45 different types of collagen polypeptide. Okay, how you're going to assemble them into structures known as superhelices, which are then known as collagen molecules. Okay, so these are collagen chains that we've discussed here, the individual protein. We're actually going to try uh, three collagen proteins together to make a super helix.